Don, you make the extraordinary claim, backed up by some sophisticated computer simulations, that evolution, by favoring fitness, drives truth to extinction. Yeah. How, how then can we deal with reality and what are the implications of that? It's such an extraordinary result. It, it is at first a little bit surprising and you, you would wonder how could true perceptions be useful? How could it possibly be that true perceptions could guide useful behavior? And fortunately we have a nice metaphor with the advent of computers and laptops and, and, and user interfaces that I think can help us to see what's going on here. Uh, if you look at your laptop uh, interface, the desktop of it. Mm -hmm. um, you might have uh, a blue rectangular icon for a file that you're working with. And that, that icon might be in the lower right-hand corner of your, of your screen. Does that mean that the file itself that you're working on is blue or rectangular or in the lower right-hand corner of mm -hmm. the computer? Well, obviously not. Those, I mean, anybody who thought that really doesn't understand what computers are about or what yeah. interfaces are about. The color of the interface has nothing to do with the color of a file. A file doesn't even have color. Mm -hmm. The shape of the icon has uh, you know, nothing to do with the shape of the file. The file doesn't really have a shape. And so none of the properties of the graphics on the screen are supposed to reflect true properties of the file in the computer. The whole point of the desktop interface is to hide the truth and to guide your behavior. You don't want to know about the diodes and the resistors and all the electronics inside there and all the magnetic fields and voltages and the, all the software. If you had to know all of that stuff, you could never paint a picture, you know, edit your photograph or write a paper. Right. So you, what, what you want is an interface that hides the complexity that you don't need to know so that you can do the things you need to do. And so we have a nice example on our, just anytime you use a computer, of a case where Something is there that's not showing you the truth, and it's useful because it doesn't show you the truth. <laughs> it's not lying to you. It's actually helping you, but it's helping you by hiding the truth. And so evolution has done the same thing for us. It has given us perceptions that are like a user interface. Think of space and time as your desktop, and physical objects as the icons within your desktop. And to ask you know, this, this brown table, to say, well, is my perception true? Does the, is there really a brown table in objective reality independent of my perceptions is the same kind of mistake as saying, well, the icon on my screen is blue and rectangular. Is the file itself really blue and rectangular? Well, the answer isn't even no. <laughs> it's, it, the answer is that's the wrong question to ask. It's a different category. It's, a diff it's what they call a category error in, in, in right, philosophy. Right. So, it, so it's striking. We always think about our perceptions as being about the truth. Now, is your metaphor a strong metaphor? Or, uh, have you thought deeply about it? Because that metaphor is enormously powerful in terms of, uh, of reflecting the, uh, our lack of capacity of understanding what reality is. I mean, it would be hopeless. It's impossible to tell from the user interface on a computer uh, not just what the source code is, but, but all the electronics and, the, and the, um, the voltages and the capacity and the structure of the CPU. I mean, that's just so far beyond anything that you would even know existed. I agree. I mean, if, if someone were to say, uh, you know, I want you to use only what you see on the desktop, the pixels. And tell me what's going on. And from that, figure out a theory that's, about that's, what's going on inside impossible. the computer. That's going to be a really, really tough time. No, that's impossible. Well, um, I mean, you might, you, you, might, you might have, you'd have to have a billion theories to come, would have a chance to have one of them to be correct. You'd have no idea of adjudicating between them based on that data alone. Right, so you have to make assumptions, right? So you're, and you're free to make assumptions. And, and I'll just jump to the assumption I make here to solve the problem. So I don't take our perceptions of space and time as literally true, I take them as a desktop. To solve the mind-body problem, I've tried to say, let's take consciousness as fundamental. So what's behind the interface is consciousness. Right? Just in the example of the computer, what's behind the screen are all those diodes and resistors and so forth. Yeah. I'm saying what's behind space and time and physical objects, for us, is a world of what I call conscious agents or consciousness. The nice thing about that theory is I'm conscious. You're conscious. I'm proposing that the objective reality behind this interface is not utterly alien to who I am. There is a chance for me to begin to understand that objective reality behind the interface 
because I'm not utterly separated from it. So it's a different situation than what's behind the computer screen. So wait a minute. How, uh, w w but what happens when you then ask the question where your consciousness came from? Because it came through an evolutionary process. R right. So when you take this point of view now, if space and time are not fundamental, right. then we have to rethink evolution from the get-go. So I've used evolutionary game theory to conclude that everything that we see around us in, in our perceptions is not veridical, it's just a user interface. Okay. And that means I have to I'll go, go back yeah. and rethink what do I mean, what, are, what is the core of evolutionary theory that I can keep? I have to give up some physicalist assumptions that are typically made in evolution. Okay. Um, so most evolutionary biologists are also physicalists. Of course. But it's not absolutely necessary to be a physicalist to have the key principles of evolution. So you need replication, you need selection, and you need um, you know, s some kind of genetic material to, to pass on ver the variations. Right? Yeah, but, but are you saying that consciousness began that, was there before the process of evolution That's right. began? That's right. I, 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 you know, I, I say that with, with, uh, with tremor awe. in my voice. Absolutely. So, this, <laughs> so for me to be entirely consistent, if I'm going to actually say that consciousness is fundamental, then I'm saying that the Big Bang itself is something that has to be understood from within a framework in which consciousness is fundamental. The standard view, and I understand that this is completely non-standard, what I'm saying. The standard view is that the Big Bang happened oh, 13.7 right. billion and, years and ago. Evolution occurred in a and, long and, yeah, process and right. eventually consciousness kind of arose accidentally here on Earth and maybe other places and, and totally accidentally. That's right. So my story is completely different. So when I, when I asked the question, uh, how, how did consciousness uh, uh, emerge through an evolutionary process, your answer is it didn't. It didn't. That's right. Consciousness didn't emerge from um, a prior physical process of evolution. Um, it consciousness is fundamental, and so we have to rethink uh, the whole history of the universe. Actually, from this point of view, from the Big Bang up through evolution, we have to rethink it in terms of uh, how to rewrite that story, consistent with all of our current science, but understanding that it's consciousness that's fundamental, not the physical universe. And you know, one thing that comes out of this as well is no one has been able to give a reason for why consciousness would evolve. What is it for? And so my attitude is it didn't evolve. It's the ground from which evolution occurs.